The views, comments, stories, and opinions shared within this podcast are my own or those of my guests and in no way represent the views of the company or companies that I or we work for. All stories, events, and tales shared within this episode may or may not have happened in the manner in which they are told. They may or may not have even happened at all. The details have been changed to protect the innocent and the guilty alike. This is Squawk Ident. You're listening to Squawk Ident an aviation podcast dedicated to the journey and the challenges surrounding the life and career of Aviator Tony and his guests. Together, we will explore the many pathways to an aviation profession, the realities of what a professional aviator can expect in today's marketplace, and we share many stories along the way. I'm your host, Aviator Tony, an airline pilot currently flying for a legacy airline with more than 20 years on the flight line. This is episode 21 of Squawk Ident, recorded on the 29th of January, 2020, from the Aviator Sound Studios somewhere in Southern California. On this episode of Squawk Ident, I have the opportunity to speak with a phenomenal pilot that joins us from the other side of the Atlantic, from his gorgeous home in the beautiful town of Vicenza in Northern Italy. He shares with us his journey, which is filled with courage, sacrifice, and tenacity. From Italy to Albuquerque, Aruba, Africa, and the Isle of Man, he is a true world traveler. Join us in the exploration of this amazing aviator's journey. All this and more on this episode of Squawk Ident. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Right after a brief word from our sponsors. Okay, and welcome back to the show. I am joined today by a very special guest. Joining me all the way from the other side of the planet, from his humble abode in Italy, I'd like to introduce you to someone very special. He uh, started his career out beginning prior to aviation in the Italian Army. First uh, went to officer school. Uh, and then uh, tried to get into the aviation program through the military in Italy. The process is complicated, a little convoluted. In the end, did not get selected, so he saved his money and came to the United States, settled down in a small town of Albuquerque, New Mexico, where he attended a flight school at a small non-towered airport at the time, the Double Eagle Airport in Albuquerque, New Mexico. From there, he earned all of his ratings and soon became a CFI, a double I, and MEI. That's where I met him as my very first flight instructor. You may remember the story from episode one. Then he found employment flying Cessna 402s and 310s. And then a tragic day in aviation history. 9-11, and visas started to become very restrictive. He ended up going back to Italy, to his homeland, where he became a U.S. Army-based lifeguard and did that for a little while until he could get some licensing converted from U.S. licenses over to the JAR license system that they use over in Italy. From there, he became a cargo pilot, flying Fokker 27s, and Fokker 50s. Soon got a job in Aruba, flying a Fokker 50 for passengers over into the islands. That lasted about a year, and then he ended up in the Isle of Man, flying an ATR. He then found employment back in Italy last year in 2019, and is now flying for an airline that we're going to call Zulu Air. Please help me in welcoming to the show, Mr. Luca DeFort. Hey... Hi, Anthony. How are you? Too very nice. Thank um, you, and thank you to uh, invite me to this uh, show. Oh, absolutely! Yeah. You know, and, and it's an absolute uh, pleasure to have you. 
I'm really, really happy to see your face and to hear your voice again. Oh, thank you very much. So today, uh, I'm, I feel absolutely honored to be able to sit down with you and ask you a couple questions on your journey. Uh, for those of my listeners that might be new to the show, uh, let me explain a little bit about what we do here at Squawk Ident. Squawk Ident is an aviation podcast dedicated to the journey and the challenges of aviators all across the world, including myself, Aviator Tony, and those of my guests. So what we do is we talk a little bit about how we got started. And today, I have the privilege of talking to you about your initial journey and how it continues to this day. So take me back. Let's go back to your first inclination of wanting to be a pilot. When did it start? Well, that is, is a long journey then, because it started uh, since I was a little kid. And uh, I was probably three or four years old when uh, when I was looking up in the in the sky and and looking at those aircraft flying overhead my my house. I used to live uh, very close to an American Air Force base uh, called Aviano in Italy, in the northeast of Italy, not too far from Venice. And, um, and basically, every aircraft that was landing in in Aviano, they were turning base right over the top of my. Uh, my parents' house. And so I was at the age of six or seven, probably I was able to recognize every single uh, fighter jet by the noise of the engine. So I grew up with the uh, noise of the uh, Phantom F-4 or the uh, F-104 Starfighter or uh, all of those old aircraft. <clears throat> and I think that is the reason why I got so involved in aviation, and uh, I grew up in a in a normal family, not rich, not too poor, and uh, uh, but uh, you know to join aviation uh, in those days were was pretty pretty expensive, and so uh, that's why, as you mentioned, I went through a uh, few different careers trying to to achieve my goal. And uh, honestly, I started at uh, pretty late uh, in uh, in my age uh, because I started at the age of 28 to uh, to get my private pilot license. And as you said, I started in the United States in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Yeah. And so, what out of all the places and all the flight schools and all of not just the United States, but really you had a choice to to really go anywhere. What made you choose, one, to come to the United States to get all your pilot licensing? And two, what made you choose Albuquerque? Yeah, that's that's kind of a funny story, too. If you have time to listen to Absolutely. me. Absolutely. <laughs> that's why <Yeah>. we're here. <laughs> well, just uh, let me take you back to uh, my military service. So I spent about almost five years in the Army and always, you know, uh, growing this dream in my head of uh, becoming a pilot. And um, as you said, I couldn't make it through the um, selection of the military, so uh, I decided to to go civilian. So I uh, finished my military service, and with my best friend at that time, uh, we decided to take a coast to coast drive uh, from New York to LA. And uh, his sister used to leave, well, st she still leaves in uh, in Albuquerque. So we said, okay, we make a plan. We have two weeks of time. So we rented a car in New York and we started driving. So we went to Chicago and then uh, down through the Route 66 all the way down to uh, uh, Illinois and then Memphis. And then uh, I think is the M40 that goes from east to west. Yeah, Interstate 40, yeah. Yeah, Interstate 40. And we stopped in Albuquerque. And I, uh, we spent uh, three, four days in Albuquerque, and I talked to uh, the husband of my friend's sister. And uh, he, I, talked, uh, I told him about my dream of flying and so on, and he said, he mentioned this little airport, in Double Eagle 2 Airport in uh, West Mesa, uh, just outside Albuquerque. And so he told me there, and um, I started talking 
talking to a couple of people in, uh, in the fly school and I, I really loved the place. Uh, the weather was nice, the, uh, the people were friendly and, uh, and welcoming and, uh, and I really fell in love for, I fell in love for, for that place. We continue our journey to uh, to LA, and I, I was keep dreaming of uh, of flying. And uh, I, I took actually an intro flight that day. Sorry. Oh, it, I oh, took an intro Eagle? flight. Yeah, double eagle. Yeah, what was and, the name uh, of the uh, flight center there, the FBO? It was uh, West Mesa Aviation. Okay. At that time, yeah. Yeah. And um, I remember the uh, the name of my first instructor was. Uh, Chuck Tuberville, an older gentleman, then he was the um, the director of the flying school at that time. Unfortunately, he passed a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, but so we continue the, the drive to L.A. and then we reach L.A., we flew back to Italy. And so uh, I choose the United States and in specific Albuquerque for this reason, basically. It's just a case of luck or a case of i i don't know how you you can yeah, say luck or, i guess yeah. circumstances yeah, yeah exactly. sure yeah so so you decided you know you did your trip you flew back obviously at that point and yeah yeah, yeah and yeah. so what did you what did you do did you were you still yeah. at home with your parents or were you in, on your own or how did that work well at that time i uh, i finished my uh army of course and my university as well and uh, so i said okay well i need money to uh, to start the flying school because when i went to visit the, the flying school they um, they I, I asked you know how much does it cost the course and uh, how how does it work and so i picked up all the information required mm -hmm. and um, and they explained me and actually i bought at that time uh, a kit of uh, cd roms <laughs> At that uh, time, we were called the CD on DVDs. The, uh, the King the School, was it? The, exactly. Yep, exactly. John and the Martha. King School. It's exactly. just that easy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Hey, absolutely that one. And uh, I started looking through that course and uh, I said, well, I can do this, you know. And uh, so I enrolled. I called them up on the phone maybe a week or a month later and uh, I said, yeah, I want to follow the course. Mm -hmm. So uh, the next step was to find a job for uh, maybe a season. So I went, uh, I think that was um, during the, I went to the United States during the summer and I came back. So I started working during the winter, the season in, uh, uh, in the Mont Blanc here in the Alps. I was a ski instructor for, uh, for a while. So I did that for about three, four months. I collect enough money to be able to fly back to uh, to uh, United States and pay for my uh, private pilot license. So that's the first step. I started with the private pilot license and I, um, I spent probably three months uh, in Albuquerque. So I, I got to know all the, the people, all the system. And uh, uh, I was not really a good um, English speaker at that time. So it took me a little longer probably than usual than, than everybody else to get a license. But, sure. Yeah. So you started out and you did, you mentioned to me that you, you did your private instrument and did you do the commercial as well at Double Eagle? Uh, no, I did uh, private. So let's say uh, in 1999, so mm -hmm. I, I went the first time in 1998. Then, uh, uh, then uh, a year later, basically, not even a year later, but six months later was 1999. And I uh, went back and did my private. Mm -hmm. Then uh, I finished it at the beginning of the summer. Uh, so I came back to Italy. I worked during a, a summer season, mm. and, uh, and I collect enough money to go back for to do my my instrument rating in the uh, winter uh, 1999. Mm -hmm. So another two three months of uh, study and uh, and uh, and flying for the instrument rating, and then after that I met the. Um, uh, I, we, I became close friend uh, to the owner of the school, and uh, yeah, he it, it said, you know, he could help me out to get a job if I had the CFI, CFWI, MEI done mm -hmm. uh, in in the West Mesa Aviation. Okay. Um, yes. Yeah, I decided to uh, to go to uh, Oklahoma, Norman, Oklahoma, uh, because they were offering. A, a crash course, basically, in I think it was about four, 
three, four to five months, they were able to give me to take me through the commercial CFI and CFII. Do you remember which school uh, that was, or it was? I think it was called Norman. Oh, uh, just Flying Norman school. Flying School in Norman, Norman yeah. Oklahoma. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I probably need to, yeah, it was a big flying school, but now I don't, um, uh, yeah. the Norman flying school. I'll look it up and see yeah. if I find it. I'll put it in the show notes. Yeah. Yeah. So after that, um, I came back to, um, to, uh, Albuquerque and the owner of the fly school said, yes, I keep my promise and I give you a job. So, and I start flying and uh, build up my time and my experience as a CFI, CFII. Uh, after approximately one year and enough hours to take my uh, MEI, I did my MEI as well at uh, Double Eagle 2. Mm. And then I met a certain guy called Anthony. <laughs> Yes, and uh, do you remember that day? Uh, uh, Julie had uh, purchased a Discovery flight for me. I believe it was a ninety-nine dollar Discovery flight. You know, go up in the pattern. You know, a couple touch and goes, and you know, a couple circuits, and yeah. you're good. I, and I, think uh, we I was nervous, bit. and uh, I think I had a friend of mine with me uh, that was visiting, and I was nervous, and and here comes this gentleman, larger than life, uh, and he's walking towards me, and I look, I side glance over to to my wife Julie, and I say. This guy's Italian. This guy's, he's got to be Italian. He <laughs> comes up and he goes, and he goes, Ciao, my name is Luca. I am your flight instructor. Oh, ma sei italiano. Allora possiamo parlare italiano. Next thing you know, we're, we're just up there like two paisans in the cockpit. And it's just the charisma and just the excitement of the first time for me being in a small aircraft. It, it just blew up from there. I was hooked. That was it. My life was ruined from that point forward. Ruined. Hey, I'm sorry, I'm part of it. <laughs> you see, and you were a part of it. So exactly. I thank you for that because, I mean, no. now I look back with just the biggest affection for that moment because that really, that Discovery flight shaped my career. It shaped yeah. my my journey. And, you know, and, and your journey, it, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't end there. It, you know, you... You went on flight instructing for quite some time, and we had a lot of fun together. I can remember some long cross countries together in that DA twenty. Yeah. Remember, we almost got stuck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one time. Uh, going, where were we? Somewhere in from Albuquerque, we went all the way to California, was, uh, didn't we? Carlsbad or something? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Retno, uh, okay, uh, bluff where? something, bluff, Red Bluff. I remember something. No. Red Bluff, uh, Red maybe. Bluff, maybe was it Red Bluff. Maybe, yeah. Yeah, something like that. Somewhere, yeah. yeah. Was, and yeah, yeah, we and we did this long cross country and and you know, things were happening and and I finished my private, I can remember that. And uh and you said to me, you know, can you imagine working for say American Airlines, flying over to Italy, doing an overnight in Rome, going to stay with your cousin and, and your with, uncle? See you over know? there, exactly. You know, and and I thought, wow, really, this is amazing. And uh, granted, I'm not doing, you know, the equipment that flies into Milan or to Rome right now, <laughs> but I do work for the company that uh, that, that has that could. possibility. Yeah, it has that possibility. <laughs> so yeah, at Legacy Airlines. Um, so, uh, <laughs> you know, I have you to thank in, in large part for that. You know, you helped shape I, that uh, journey and I say thank you to you sir no but no, so no. thank so, you to be so good as a as a the student that's not a student too. yeah yeah. Yeah, well, yeah yeah you know it, it you made it easy and the journey then it picked up for you uh as i i think i was working on my instrument and you were doing some moonlighting over at the uh, international airport flying for a cargo operator can you tell me a little bit about that yeah, after after uh, about four years of flight instructing, and uh, I picked up enough experience to apply for a for a larger company. So uh, I um, I had a, a friend that he was a flight instructor as well, and at West Mesa, and he moved over to um, um, Albuquerque International Airport to fly for a cargo operator. At that time, it was called um, Aero Charter and Transport, and that is they were operating. For especially, or let's say mainly for uh, Wells Fargo's bank. I don't know if I can mm. say that. Yeah, not, you but, were uh, flying checks around. Uh, they were flying that, checks. Yeah. Cor don't do that exactly. anymore. But no. uh, back in the day, yeah, checks and newspapers, right? 
Exactly. Yeah. And most of the time was was checks, and that, and those checks had to be delivered on time. Mm-hmm. We had a window of I don't know, a few minutes, maybe five minutes. After that, we had to start paying some big fees, and that was interesting because. Oh, wow. You know the weather. Uh, the route that I remember the most were, were was uh, the route from Albuquerque to Dallas, uh, Edison, and and you know you're crossing over the Tornado Alley and you're flying a twin engine uh, prop, which doesn't climb very much. No, nope, no. Nope. And uh, <laughs> you know fully loaded. Like, yeah. But anyway, that was uh, was a, an interesting uh, uh, time, and I flew for them for approximately two years. Um, and build enough experience, I think, on a, on the multi-engine complex aircraft, yeah. uh, weather-wise as well, and uh, cargo operation as well. It was interesting, and uh, yeah, it was was a uh, was a good experience. Well, yeah, I was flying uh, Cessna 402s and uh-huh. Cessna 310s. They had also a caravan, um, a Cessna caravan, uh, but we were not using it that much. Um, but uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, during that time, I we were ahead, we had different routes, different destinations. We were flying to uh, from Albuquerque all the way to Phoenix, Arizona, north to Denver, um, uh, east to Dallas, as I said, and Houston, mm-hmm. and to the south we were going to Carlsbad and um, Four Corners too. Uh, yeah. Four Corners as well. I remember yeah, you, Farmington, Yeah, going yeah. In there. Uh-huh. That was a, like a triangle flight. It was uh, Albuquerque, Farmington, Farmington, Gallup, Gallup back to Albuquerque. It was mm. kind of a, a triangle kind of thing. And uh, I I remember that uh, Farmington flight, the four corner flight, because one time I, it's not really nice to say that, but anyway, I, I flew, I was carrying a, a, the head of a dog, a dead dog, huh. because the owner wanted to be analyzed. And uh, they had a special hospital in Farmington to uh, oh, to, uh, a pet to do autopsy, that. Autopsy, huh? Yeah. Wow. That was interesting. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Basically. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Truth be told, you, we don't you, know, but there yeah, a lot exactly. of the flights but that the, I operate at Legacy, uh, we yeah. do get uh, shipping. Uh, what they call no talks or notices to captain, no and talks, it has because yeah, 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 it has yeah. dry ice in there to preserve, yeah, yeah, yeah. and usually there's a, another code on there saying that it's a biological. So we get parts all the time. We never know yeah. what it is. It could be, you know, blood, you know, hemoglobin, or it could be body parts. It could be parts, cadavers, uh, it could, you know, for yeah. whatever reason. So yeah, it'd be it's amazing how often that kind of thing happens At, in a yeah. smaller aircraft. You of course you know what's in it, you know, because they, they the guy loading yeah, it tells they, you. But they, we don't. And back in those days, they were not. They were using dry ice, yes, but everything was uh, was actually put inside a plastic bags, you know. Oh. So it was a, it was a simple way of transporting it, thinking that they don't smell or the. In the heat of the summer uh. in New Mexico, and <laughs> and <laughs> and a poor dog. Oh no! That was that. Yeah, that was the, or, the most horrible smell I had I ever smelled in my life. Oh my god! <laughs> that was yeah awful. But, but it was my fault at the end because I tried to ventilate the cockpit. So mm-hmm. I opened, and it says in the three ten, you have a little window on the side of the of the thing uh-huh. of the of your um, of the side of uh, of the wall basically uh-huh. you can open the window in flight there's no problem but you know that when a fly uh, when an aircraft flies through the air it creates suction uh-huh. around the fuselage so right all face. the air inside the cockpit was <laughs> passing through my nose first and out oh, of the no. window <laughs> <laughs> Horrible. Yeah, I can see how you can remember that flight. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. <laughs> so then, um, as I mentioned, you know, that was uh, around 2001. And I think you were still instructing, were you not? We were working on Correct. instrument time yes. together. Yeah. yeah. So you and I yeah. were working on that. And then uh, a tragic event happened in the, in this country and really around the world. It's 9-11. Exactly. And it impacted everyone in aviation. Um, and I know that's kind of at the point where I was looking at my spouse saying, maybe becoming an airline pilot's not a good idea. And her response was no, if you change your passion, your career now, then the acts of some terrorists have dictated your, your path and they win because they've affected you. So if this is something you really want to do, 
to go out and do it uh, regardless. And things will pick up. It'll just be time. But that's what happened. I had decided to leave my employer uh, at the time that was helping me pay my way through life. And, you know, I end up moving to Phoenix, Arizona to go to a flight school, uh, not unlike uh, the one you went to in Oklahoma, where it was basically a flight farm where you we were there every day and it was a it was an impacted program that was very fast, 10 months, you go in from instrument all the way through double, double IMEI. And uh, you took a little bit different path, uh, partially because you were here on a visa that now suddenly was under the microscope because of the events of 9-11. What exactly transpired there? Yeah, well, I remember, unfortunately, that uh, sad event very clearly because I was uh, getting ready to go uh, work at the fly school, and I had uh, my student waiting for me at the fly school already. He he got there a little earlier, and... uh, uh, I was just getting dressed, and I remember to turn on the TV. And uh, unfortunately, there was this uh, this this craziness uh, on TV that we uh, we all uh, uh, saw. And um, uh, nothing. I called the fly school, and they said, uh, "No, everything is uh, closed. The air, the airspace is uh, over Albuquerque was closed, and so there was no flight today." And so I decided to stay home and watching the news and and basically we couldn't go flying for about two weeks mm-hmm. and uh, uh, then we started flying only IFR so only instrument uh, uh, flights were allowed uh, with the with um, uh, an instrument flight plan filed mm-hmm. and um, uh, during that time basically uh, also I needed to work. Uh, a lot because uh, uh, that was the only way of uh, basically income. Sure. My only income was through the fly school. Yeah. So I kind of invented a way of teaching VFR uh, students uh, on a, an IFR fly plan, uh, which is uh, okay. You can do it because there is no regulation against that. But it was kind of strange if I had to compare with that, uh, everybody else. Uh, sure. You know, that I remember the month of uh, uh, of uh, of the terrorist attack. Um, I was able to fly anyway, fifty hours, and the second flight instructor uh, had ten hours or something like that, max. You know, and the, the old the old month, and for that reason, because. I said, you know, we, we go flying. We like to fly. We try to fly. Even if you are a private pilot, with the beautiful weather that we have in Albuquerque, we can go fly on an IFR flight plan. So we filed most of the flight were from Albuquerque to Santa Fe, approximately 35 minutes flight time. And and then we filed again from Santa Fe back to Albuquerque on a different airway. So we were able to do slow flights, stalls, all the... Uh, exercises required for a private on on an IFR flight plan. So at the end of the day, I mean, September was actually a good month for me anyway, uh, if I don't consider the, the terrible events in, in New York. Um, unfortunately for me, for my career in the United States, uh, the event, the terrorist event, um, uh, unfortunately caused me to go back to Italy because um, my visa was expiring in in um, uh, three years after, and I couldn't renew because the regulation changed completely, and I, I, I was not able to to extend it. Basically, mm-hmm. so I went back to Italy, and as you mentioned before, I changed job for about a year because in the meantime, my my daughter was born in the United States, in Albuquerque. I was getting married as well. And uh, so I had to support uh, my family. So I had to take anything, any kind of job available. Yeah. And and that moment, um, I, uh, as you said, I was working as a lifeguard for, um, for an American uh, base in Italy. And in the meantime, I was converting my licenses in my uh, fly licenses in from FAA to JAA. And yeah, that's basically last one year mm-hmm. of uh, uh, working outside the aviation field, and um, 
and converting my license, basically. Yeah. How long did it take you to get all of your licenses converted from FAA to JAA? Yeah, that um, the conversion between the FAA to JAA took me approximately one year, a full year, because I had to, um, uh, let's say, the, the regulation in Europe or in Italy at that time, because then after, after that, uh, they had a new version of uh, the JAA became uh, EASA. And now we are under regulation of EASA which is a little different than before. Anyway, it took me approximately one year uh, because I had to pass 14 subjects. And the 14 subjects went from uh, air law to uh, meteorology to uh, radio communication to engines and power plants. And I, I don't even remember how many we had to do it, to study and, and, and pass the exams. The exams were held at... Um, the uh, Italian National Authority, which is in uh, in Rome, and uh, they were held in uh, English language. And um, but to be able to to attend that test, uh, I had to follow a course that required approximately approximately ten months of uh, of a uh, course of, uh, of classrooms. Let's mm -hmm. say. So I enrolled in a different in a, in a new school, a flying school in Forli, which is in the middle of Italy, and uh, yeah, and I was uh, working and studying at the same time. A little hard, but it was actually an interesting course. Yeah, I've heard many uh, uh, things about how difficult it is in comparison to a lot of the FAA certification exams that the the international exams are usually a lot more in depth. Would you agree with that statement? Or uh, I have to say they are a little different, and uh, in the sense that they are or organized differently. Mm -hmm. um, the Italian one that I attend, I have to say, they were very difficult for me because I came from uh, a very well organized system which was uh, the FAA one to a system which was a little less organized let's say the Italian one uh, bureaucracy uh, and uh, organization was uh, was a big factor on that mm. uh, but the subject that we studied here uh, in Italy uh, it was just a, a more depth um, a more in-depth, let's say, subjects of the same uh, matter that okay. we studied in, in the United States. Yeah. So basically it's the same. Um, the United States system, I think, is more um, simple because is uh, they teach you what you really need to know in the aviation. In, uh, in Italy, they do it a little bit more complicated just because you study a lot of nice to know subjects uh, that at the end of the day you will never probably use in your career uh, sure a little more comprehensive knowledge that has been yes. the same probably a long time exactly you know. so okay. so that yeah. took about a I year mean, to for you to get everything converted over and once you were completing all of your your licensing you could then find employment in italy where you were uh, yes, How I was able happen? to. Yeah, yeah, I, I was able to find a job, even if it was not easy, because the competition uh, in that uh, period was very, very high. Uh, that happened in 2007. 2007, I don't know if you remember, we had a little crisis, you know, uh, we uh, the uh, in aviation. Uh, there was not many jobs, at least in Europe. We didn't have mm -hmm. many jobs, so the competition was high. And, and um, my curriculum, my CV was on the bottom, let's say, of the list because I uh, initially, to find a job in, uh, in the airline, you had to have um, many hours as a multi-crew, uh, which I didn't have because... Uh, in Albuquerque, I was flying uh, cargo, but single pilot IFR, but single pilot. So the multi-crew experience was um, 
uh, yeah. I didn't have, I didn't have. And, um, so, but anyway, I found a, a friend of mine, which told me about this company. It was a cargo company, uh, flying Fokker 27, an old, very old, uh, type of aircraft, but, um, very, very reliable, especially for cargo operations. And, uh, so basically this friend of mine introduced me to, um, the owner of this company and, uh, luckily for that. I was able to get the job. I had to pay for my type rating, which was uh, approximately 25,000 euros, which is $25,000 yeah, say American high. US. Yeah. yeah, for a very old aircraft, that was very high. Yeah. And in the same time, I found um, uh, a, 7, 3, a 747 type rating was for 24,000. Oh. <laughs> it was funny. <laughs> a, little, a thousand cheaper. less than Fokker. <laughs> yeah, Bigger figure. aircraft for the cheaper price. Yeah. But yeah, because it was so rare, this uh, older aircraft was so rare that yeah. we had only one sim flight simulator in Brussels, in all around the world. It was the only certified flight simulator for the Fokker 27 was in Brussels. And that's where I did my type rating. That's why probably the cost was so high as well. Mm -hmm. I finished and completed the uh, type rating in uh, approximately a month, a month and a half. And then uh, after that, I was employed by this cargo operator, which for approximately five years, we operated only around Europe. And for the next, uh, for the three years after, uh, we flew, I flew in Africa most of the time. And uh, cargo meaning uh, post, meaning all kind of uh, values, uh, paints, I had uh, one time I had, I've, I've, I carried a, a, um, only one paint. The old aircraft was loaded with one paint. The dimension was approximately five feet by seven feet. Uh -huh. And the price was unknown. I uh, was carrying on the jump seat, the owner of, uh, sorry, the, the, the manager of the Florence um, Museum. Uh -huh. And I asked him, what is the price of this paint? And I think it was a Michelangelo paint. painting. Yeah. A painting, sorry. A painting, and yeah. uh, and, uh, and the, she said, uh, no, there is no price for this. Wow. <laughs> was, Can you um, imagine uh, yeah. that? Little, priceless yeah, piece that of artwork. Priceless One piece of One piece of cargo in the whole airplane. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That was it. I was, that was it. It was amazing to see it as well. Uh, yeah. And... Um, so yeah, I finished with this cargo company in Africa, mm -hmm. two years uh, f uh, carrying um, oil rigs uh, components mm -hmm. uh, most of the time, and money. That was incredible as well. A lot of five tons of money. <laughs> five tons of uh, gold bullion or five tons of uh, cash, oh, cash? Oh, cash, cash. <laughs> oh, man. Wow. <laughs> Even if the value of those uh, cash are much less, it was still five tons of cash. <laughs> tons of, yeah, that's still a lot. Yeah. 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 So, and this was up to about 2000 and was it 15 or? 14. Yeah. 2014. And so yeah. what was the transition after that? You were back and forth in Africa, Italy, and and then what? Yeah, between 2012 and 2000 and the end of 2014, when the company went bankrupt, um, uh, I was flying in Africa. Mm -hmm. And uh, then, unfortunately, because the, the global economic crisis the company um, basically lost contract here and there, and they decided to close. So beginning of 2015, on Fokker 50 this time, because in the meantime, I did the type rating on the Fokker 50, uh, I moved to Aruba. Nice. Uh, flying, yes, definitely a, a, a beautiful step up in in environment. Yeah. Uh, beautiful place in the Caribbean, in the Dutch Caribbean. And uh, the Fokker 50 was actually also a very nice yeah. aircraft to fly passengers along uh, between the islands because it was a very, very short hops between uh, Aruba and um, uh, Colombia or Venezuela, which was next door and uh, Curaçao as well. Hmm. Uh, short flights, passengers, and with this company, I made my captain position as well. 
the camp the, uh, the company was um, looking for captains mm -hmm. only and but i was a first officer until that time first officer with a lot of experience uh, because uh, i had my approximately 5000 hours when i left the united states and i built up another 4 to 5000 hours as a multi crew in europe at that stage and uh, so the company that i and uh, I joined in, in Aruba, they asked me if I wanted to become a captain with them. So they said, oh, yeah, of course. So uh, they put me through the uh, commander course and uh, I passed it through and I started flying as a captain passenger in the Fokker 50 mm -hmm. in the Caribbean, which was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> it was a very nice experience. Yeah. How long did you get to do that for? approximately for one year okay then uh, because i was hired as a contract and i had my family in italy uh, even if they came to visit for approximately three months but my contract was eight weeks on and uh, three weeks off mm -hmm. so for eight weeks at a time i was not able to see my family my kids and in the meantime i had other two kids so a total three and they were growing up without a father, let's say, which was not that good. So I decided to look for another job a little closer to my family. And that's why after one year, uh, beginning of uh, 2016, I uh, applied for um, uh, an ATR position, which uh, ATR 72, 42 position, uh, passengers uh, for uh, an Irish company called uh, uh, Tobarter. Mm -hmm. And um, I applied, they called me up, I passed the interview, and uh, they put me through the ATR uh, 72 course, typewriting. And um, yeah, that took about uh, five weeks. It's a very complex aircraft, um, system-wise. So it, it, it took me a, a little longer than usual to, to do it. So five mm -hmm. weeks instead of four. Uh, and nothing. And I spent uh, four years with them. And I finished to work for, uh, for, um, for them in um, last year, 2019, approximately March. Yeah. And so you were there living on the Isle of Man which is uh, south of uh, Ireland, right, or southeast? It's, it's, actually, it's actually, no, it's actually between uh, uh, Ireland uh -huh. and UK. And, the and UK, it's yeah. a little island, yes. So it's, south it's, of Liverpool. Let's say it's uh, west of Liverpool. West of Liverpool, okay. Uh, well, yeah, northwest of Liverpool and right east from Dublin, let's so, say, oh, right okay. in between. So yeah. right there. So good weather, huh? Well, yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I enjoyed it. That means, but the uh, passengers maybe didn't, but I did enjoy yeah. it. <laughs> and that must have been tough too, because uh, it's not a very big island. And no, it's actually, down. yeah, is a very small island. It's approximately uh, fifty kilometers long, so that means about uh, what is it, 40, 40 miles long, times. Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. 20 miles wide and uh, you can drive in an hour all around the island basically uh, it but is 85 85,000 people lives on this island and they need to go across that means going to liverpool to major uh, where the major hospitals are mm -hmm. and uh manchester and birmingham those were our top destinations and, and also dublin on the other side westbound yeah uh, so that those were our routes yeah. And and so living there, yeah. what was your biggest challenge? Uh, well, uh, the bi biggest challenge was to uh, to come back to visit my family in Italy. Uh, even if this time I moved uh, wife and kids on the island. Mm -hmm. But of course, my mother and my father were living, and my mother-in-law, of course, were living in Italy still. Mm -hmm. So uh, to make contact with, uh, with uh, Italy was a little difficult because out of the island, uh, we were the only uh, operator flying passengers out. And when, as you mentioned, the weather wasn't that great, uh, not even the boats were actually uh, sailing. Yeah. You know? so well, the Irish the Sea wind. has been very famous for some of the most turbulent uh, water conditions. Of water, yeah. Yeah, and weather. Yeah. Okay, so you were there until... Well, just last year. And 
until last year, until, uh, well, I moved my family back to Italy in September, but I took uh, a new job starting from the uh, beginning of April 2019, flying for uh, a Swiss company back to cargo now. Mm-hmm. And, and now you've done both. Uh, what, what do you like more, the, the challenges of flying passengers around or the cargo I, route system. I like I, I have to say that I like both because both of them has their ups and their downs let's say uh-huh. uh, of course with passengers it's more challenging to um, uh, have the customer happy let's say make them happy to uh, to have for example a nice and smooth landing and to take them on time uh, to their destinations and um but the, also you have you you have to face a lot of more problems and uh because okay my aircraft was uh, maximum of 72 passengers plus my crew and so it's not a big aircraft but still when you are you are fully loaded with 72 people there they have uh, 72 different type of uh, personalities and uh, 72 different types of uh, way of dealing with turbulence and you mm-hmm. know all these little troubles. So you have up and downs in 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 both. You have good things, bad things of both operations. Cargo, of course, if you bank a little steeper, they don't complain. The boxes <laughs> are very quiet. <laughs> so, They're but, supposed to be uh, anyway. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> But you are a little bit uh, forced to be more on time because uh, you can talk to a passenger saying, okay, we have this type of problem. We have to delay our landing. We are going to be there late. You can organize, uh, you know, um, some help after they land and this and that. Boxes cannot be late because you cannot talk to them and say, hey, we're going to be late for this. No, no, the customer wants and the client wants the delivery on time think yeah. about amazon think about dhl ups all those big names they they have to be the boxes have to be delivered on time and they have to fly so it doesn't matter if the, the weather is bad you have to find a way to do it yeah so yeah in a legal way of course and in the same way yeah sure. of course but sure. it's, yeah so you've been doing this now aviation career ah what 25, 30 years? Uh, no, man. No, 25. Don't put me down. Uh, 25. About 25. Yeah, yeah you're, you're, you and I are both yeah, pretty close to the same yeah, age, you know? So, age, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've been doing this. Well, I started with you in 90, early 99. Or yeah, middle so of 99. This time is, somewhere yeah. 99, yeah. So we are 20 years So now. we're 20 years in. 20 years. Yeah, exactly. And you're maybe a year or two ahead of me. So, uh, yeah, uh, 20 years of aviation. And, with that, you've had a very varied uh, background. You've done really, I mean, flying in Africa, flying in Aruba, you know, in in the middle of the Irish Sea and in Italy and in the U.S. And you've had to deal with all kinds of weather conditions, different aircraft types. And all of those challenges, what would you say if you had to pinpoint one challenge that was the hardest to overcome for you? What would that be? That's a big question. I have to say, probably to learn a proper English. <laughs> yeah, so to the, the struggle English of uh, language. Yeah, learning a language be and to, aviation. To, to be able to teach. Exactly. Yeah. To be able to teach, uh, because I always love to teach and pass on what was my passion to others like you. Yeah. And I really found. Um, a great experience to be able to 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 see in you know in in all my students, uh, you know that I achieved of of passing over my knowledge or my my way of thinking or my way of doing stuff. Mm-hmm. Everybody can do it differently, of course, and everybody has a style and a different style. I think that was the challenge. The most challenging part for me was to be able to. To you know, to learn English to a, a, a level good enough to achieve this—that's it. I think yeah. the rest, flying, 
it's not difficult because everybody, if I learn, I always say, if I am able to fly an aircraft, everybody can do it. I'm not a special man or anything. Yeah. I'm just, I've been uh, saying I'm the just same a, thing. <laughs> yeah, many years. <laughs> exactly. Without a mistake so, that you can't make that I've already made some point or another. <laughs> yes, I'm not. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> so you're not going to surprise me. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah. you know, I, I talk about like the journey a lot. I talk about, um, you know, the unspoken struggles that an aviator has. Most of my friends that are not in aviation, they they have no idea. They think what they see on TV and how wonderful it must be to be out in all these exotic places and and they think I'm vacationing. And, you know, they don't realize that I'm exhausted when I get to the hotel after a six-hour flight and landing at six o'clock in the morning. And, you know, I got to get my rest and dealing with time zones and, you know, this thing that they call jet lag. I, I haven't figured that one out yet because I don't really feel jet lag. I just feel exhausted most of the time. It's all exactly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but so the, yeah. the challenge, I think the number one challenge that most aviators have to come to terms with, and some have it easier than others, is the challenge of balancing this career in aviation, this passion that we all have. Because if you're not passionate about aviation, you're not going to do it. You're not going to make it. Or, right? Exactly. So how do you balance that passion? with family I mean, you spent months away from family and children and it's never easy what was your way of coping with that exactly yeah i i agree with you i mean when you are away from the family and uh, i have an experience actually with my mother-in-law i have to tell you this that every time when i started uh, you know uh, this career as a uh, airline pilot and I was flying for this uh, cargo company, and I said, uh, one time I come home and, and I say, oh, I was in Paris last week, and now, and now, oh, I went to London last week again, and, and blah blah blah, to my mother-in-law, and she said, I must, you must be happy to see all these places, and uh, you know, say, so, yeah, I said, you know, I see Paris, Charles de Gaulle, between midnight and two o'clock in the morning. And uh, is a turnaround of about two hours uh, to offload and reload my aircraft and, and then fly back <laughs> to an, an unknown place and deliver my post. And then I go to the hotel and I sleep and then uh, to get try to get ready for the next day. Right. So, yes, yeah, as, as you said, is is uh, difficult on your body, is difficult on your brain. Um, the family uh, himself has to... Uh, know what you're doing and has to understand the type of work you're doing to be able to cope with uh, w with uh, with you being away so long and i think when you uh, when you have a good relationship with your partner and with your kids with your family and you explain them what you're doing and how is your life i think they will understand and uh, they will understand what 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 you're going through. Yes, it's not always fun. It's not always um, uh, as they they show on TV. You know the pilot life. Um, it can be very fun. Uh, it can be very interesting, but it also can be very challenging. Yeah. So uh, I like to do uh, personally. I like to to do sports between uh, if I have time. And that will keep my spirit up, my try to clear my brain, uh, my mind from uh, stress and everything else, and mm -hmm. also help me to uh, to rest and um, and recover. Let's say from from because most of my flights at the moment are are night flights. Mm -hmm. So uh, like you, you have maybe jet lags or yeah. have to deal with uh, different time zones and so on. And for me, it's pretty much the same when yeah. I come home. I have a normal life, a uh, day life. When I'm flying, I have a, I'm a, a bet. Yeah. Well, you know, we've uh, we've explored your journey, I think, in very good detail. I thank you so much for uh, for taking the time out to explain the process that you went through in aviation. It's a very exciting tale uh, over multiple continents. Um, let's finish off with a, one final question today, which is, you know, we all have a handful of experiences that challenge your thought process as a pilot while you're in the cockpit. You know, we call these, uh, you know, your 
you're flying along, going through your procedures and your checklist day in, day out, and you hope for a boring flight. And once in a while, we are forced to earn our entire year's salary with one flight because of something challenging Correct. that may have happened. Is there anything you're willing to share with us uh, that you had a challenging experience in, during a flight? Uh, well, the I have to say, not at the airline level, in the sense that I was probably lucky enough to not have a major uh, technical malfunction as an airline pilot. As a cargo operator, uh, when I was early in, uh, in, in my career, when I was flying those checks around the United States, the uh, most challenging moment I had was, um, again, between the flight from Albuquerque to uh, Dallas. Mm. And I had um, a squall line between, uh, between Albuquerque and, and Dallas, and I had to go through because there was that storm was starting in the Gulf of Mexico and it was ending up all the way to Canada. So there was no way that uh, I could make it, you know, around it or, or you know, or on the top of it yeah. because uh, I, I still remember it was a tornado warning that day, that night, and the tops of those clouds were at 65,000 feet. Wow. So no way that I could get it up there. And, um, and I was, uh, I started flying in a nice and clear, uh, night from, uh, from Albuquerque. <clears throat> and I knew that I was going to, because I plan to arrive in Dallas while this squall line was passed through or just about. And instead that squall line stopped moving, uh, just over Dallas. Uh -huh. <laughs> so just over there and it, it stopped moving in. So I, I decided I had a nice weather radar with me. And so, uh, I decided to start, uh, going left and right, try to avoid. And, uh, I was in contact with the ATC and uh, Dallas said, uh, to a certain point said, told me that, uh, the, the, the squall line was, um, uh, on my left, one one big storm was on my right hand side, and he said, uh, "You know, you can turn left." But on my weather radar, I saw this big storm on my left side, so something was not uh -oh. correct there. Yeah, and uh, so it was a little uh, discussion. There was a little discussion between the, myself and the ATC, and then all of a sudden, I turned right instead of left. And uh, I followed the, inform the indication of the um, of the ATC, and I went straight into this uh, water bo water bomb. Yeah. But the funny thing was that was nice and smooth, like like the a lot of noise. I heard a lot of noise because there was a lot of water in it. Yeah. But for about thirty seconds, it was nice and quiet. There was yeah. no. No uh, movement of the aircraft, no turbulence, no vibration, nothing, no icing, nothing. Uh -huh. It was nice and smooth, which, you know, it was a magenta color, but yeah, nice. It was just all water. <laughs> exactly. Water just water. Yeah. yeah, that was probably a, 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 a good memory of that. Um, the uh, In the airline... Uh, uh, job that I took after after that experience, I had uh, a story with uh, a little uh, kid that uh, we were. Um, uh, I was transporting from the Aloman to Liverpool, and this little kid was uh, scared of flying. She during the taxi uh, from from the stand to um, to the uh, departure point, she stand up. And she starts screaming, running up and down the 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 way on on uh, wow. in the aircraft yeah. in the cabin, yeah. And so the flight attendants called me up and they said, "Okay, Captain, there is uh, this lady that she's standing up, she's running around the cabin, and we cannot stop her." So I had to stop the airplane and uh, and put the parking brake on. I, sh I left the aircraft to the uh, first officer and went back with my nice uniform and um, I stand up on top of this. Girl, the parents were sitting down, strapped into the the seats, and mm -hmm. I said, "Hey, little girl, do you want to go 
to your vacation or you want to go back home? And uh, probably I scared her and she said, no, I want to go on vacation. I want to go on vacation. So I said, okay, so then, <laughs> then follow the instruction of the flight attendants, please. And very nicely. And but she uh, she uh, looked at me and said, yes, sir. Sorry, sir. And she, oh, wow. she went to sit down and, and uh, we continue our journey. That was... Uh, and, well, did the you get the applause from the uh, other passengers, or after after we landed? Because after I think they they all felt that uh, it was pretty embarrassing for the for the kid to be <laughs> to yes. be well, you uh, know, applause that. But. Let me give you good job, good job. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, Still, Aviator I'm... Tony. You are the best for that. Ah, thank you. Well, you know, Luca. I have to say, grazie mille. You know, this time together has been wonderful. We should do this more often. This is great to be able to sit here and and see you and talk to you. Uh, I know it's late where you are, so I won't drag this out much longer. Thank you so much for being on the no show. Uh, hope you. you enjoyed it, and we would love to have you back. What do you say? Thank you for having me today, and I will be back uh, anytime you want to. Uh, uh, thank you so much. It was really, really nice. No, thank you. Thank you, Tony. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like again to thank Luca for taking the time to have this conversation. It was late in the evening where he was, and I do appreciate all of the time he spent with us, uh, giving us his story and his journey. Well, I hope you enjoyed the show. Uh, are you enjoying Squawk Ident? I'd love to hear from you. You can do so in many different ways. Uh, one of the easiest is to check out the website at www.aviatortony.com. That's Alpha, Victor, the number eight, Romeo, Tango, Oscar, November, Yankee.com. And make sure that you bookmark that page to your home screen there you can also check out the unique episode cover art that i produce for each episode you can also get your favorite squawk ident gear under the pilot shop tab you can even contribute to the show by becoming a producer of squawk ident at the bottom of the home tab every contribution collected goes towards equipment and expenses for the creation of squawk ident and now, the Aviator Sound Studios tab chronicles the development of the show and the equipment involved in producing it. Spotify listeners, you can listen, sponsor, and submit audio feedback. Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter users can search Squawk Ident Podcast or Aviator Tony and Squawk Ident to follow on the social media. In closing, I'd like again to say thank you to all of the listeners out there and all the support I've been receiving. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this grateful aviator. Keep the dirty side down, be safe, and take care of each other. (laughs) 